you'd like to join the classes live in the masjid, then click on the link below. Inshallah, it will take you to a telegram group that has the details of all the class timings, the dates, the days, the addresses and the locations of the masjid. So click on that link and hopefully we'll see you there, Inshallah. <laughs> This guy, he wants to take a shahada. Okay. So, uh, just they said they wanted you to do it. Perfect. 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 So, what time is Maghrib? Maghrib is at 9. Exactly at 9? Yeah, 9.04. Okay. So, we can start 15 minutes before. Okay. And then Any we questions? can do the shahada. And then we can do questions after. Okay. So, let me just know. Okay. Assalamu alaikum Alhamdulillah, the Sheikh's here. We're going to start now. Inshallah, we're going to finish around 8.45. And Alhamdulillah, the brother is going to uh, take his shahada today. And yeah, so we'll start. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Was salatu was salam. Ala khatim al anbiya, ashraf al mursaleen. Wa ala alihi was habi ajma'in amma bad. First and foremost, this is my first lecture in the United Kingdom. <laughs> so, Alhamdulillah. Allah has blessed it for us and uh, I want to say I'm uh, humbled by the turnout and I love all of you brothers for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this gathering uh, a means of khair for me and you today's title was regarding the Quran's refutation of atheism and I want to make this a training as well as a lecture because we have many speakers better than me that come and speak and may encourage people. But we want the lecture to be educational. I want you to take from it what you can use to give da'wah. Our da'wah is not toward personalities. Meaning we don't call towards Uthman. Uthman is nothing. He is a nobody. We call towards the Quran. We call towards the Sunnah. We call to the way of the Salaf of the Ummah. We call towards Tawheed. We call towards what is Haqq. What is the truth? So we want this to be educational as well. So those of you that have, mashallah, pens and papers, write. And those of you that are like Imam al-Bukhari, memorize. And those of you that are neither one of them, watch the video later. <laughs> and take your notes from it. فَقَالَ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَلَىٰ بَعْدَ عَوْدُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانَ الرَّجِيمِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ And in, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And in them, أَفَلَا تُبْسِرُونَ do they not ponder, think about what is in them? Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenges the atheists. Those that deny that Allah is the Khaliq to ponder upon their own selves, their own bodies and what is around them. That if they thought through this, they would recognize that there is a creator. And inshallah, today we'll talk about two aspects of it. One is the recognition that there is a creator. And then to know who is that creator. What is the haqq? What is the truth? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about them, Am khaluqul min ghayr shay? Did they create from nothing? And this is a challenge. Am or humul khaliqun? Or are they the ones that created? These are challenges. Am khalaqu samawati wal ard? And did they create the, the samawat and ard? When these challenges are put forward, atheists have no answers. They have no answers. All atheists can do is cast doubt. But they don't bring forward anything with a solution. But what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the end? But no, really, in, in reality, none of these three are realities for them. They did not come from nothing. And they did not create themselves. And they did not create the samawat, the skies and the earth. Instead, what it is, they have la yuqinun. They have no yaqeen. They have no firm belief on anything. When we look at these challenges and we look at actual science now you have to differentiate between theories and actual evidence-based science we have and this is a challenge here on video
for all the atheists out there, all those agnostics out there, all those people that think they know scientific evidence. We challenge them to bring one single evidence that can be proven through a clinical trial or put through the scientific method of inner species evolution. What does that mean? Everybody tells us evolution. This is their answer to ev evolution. What does evolution? What does that mean? Well, there's a bird. And that bird in certain environments, its beak got longer. Okay? What is it now? It's still a bird. <laughs> okay? In certain environments, its feathers changed. Okay, what is it now? Well, it's still a bird. <laughs> right? Show us an evidence where one species turned into another species. Let's put it through a clinical trial. Let's put it through a scientific method. Let's observe it. They don't have it. And this is where today atheism and Darwinism and evolutionism has become more of a blind faith than any scientific research. When we talk about evolution, what are we told by atheists? Atheists tell us that life began from nothing, somehow, whether it's a chemical soup hit by electricity or some strange uh, ideas which have not, no evidence. And then from a single gene it developed. Tell you, take notes on this. There is what is called a minimum gene concept. And this is something that we can prove in clinical trials. I will quote to you. If you look at Nature magazine, January 6, 2006, in that, in that uh, publication, they were able to see that no living organism, no living organism can go below 200 genes. To under 200 genes, it cannot be. Tell you. The challenge we will put, by the way, the least that they could actually function was 397 genes. The challenge we will put to atheists, if that is true, that no living organism can have less than 200 genes, and in a clinical trial, we can subtract genes and show that when you fall under that number, no organism can function, how did that evolve? To evolve, what we used to be taught in, at our universities and schools, that you had a single or a dual gene, and then it developed. But science has proven that false. That it could not be. So who set that minimum number? Who is the one that put that first organism with more than 200 genes for it to function? Otherwise, it could not have survived. When we put these challenges out, we get no answer. We get rhetoric. No, 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 Darwin. Darwin what? Darwin what? Explain it to us. Show it to us with evidences. When we look at each gene, each gene contains complex proteins with a range of 1,000 to 10,000 amino acids. Each gene. The minimum you have to have is around 200 plus. Imagine the design there. Imagine the sophistication there. <coughs> each gene having up to 10,000 amino acids. Who designed that? How did that randomly develop? These are questions that when we put to atheists scientifically, they cannot give us an answer. The atheist fantasy of a zero gene has been debunked by science. Most living organisms have around 3 billion, with a B, 3 billion specialized pieces of information. Now you tell me, how does that get to be? Today, if I was to tell you, and to be honest, that this phone that I have, it evolved from grains of sand. Nobody made it. Now you can tell me, well, I could go to a factory. Sure, you could go to a factory. But did you see this one being made? This particular? No. But I'm telling you about this particular phone. Nobody made it. Over trillions of years, grains of sand evolved on their own. No Apple, no Steve Jobs, no factories in China, none of that. Right? By themselves and developed into this phone. By a raising of hands, who would believe me? 
If you would, I gotta sell you a bridge or something. <laughs> huh? If you wouldn't believe me, why not? <coughs> what is more complicated about this phone than my body? Does it see better than me? Does it heal itself like my body? Does it have white blood cells? I mean, if you look at the human body, if you unfusi him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in them, why don't they think about this? Look at just insulin. May Allah protect us all from diabetes. Right? Insulin is a hormone that is used to break down glucose or sugars. And in a functioning healthy body, the exact amount that is needed is put forth. Tell you, who controls that? Right? Does my phone have such a function? No. Right? If your body gets cut, if you get a scratch, what happens? Do you sit there and, and, and with your own mind say, okay, white blood cells start moving, scabbing? No. Automatically, subhanAllah, your body goes into action. Starts to make a scab, to heal the wound. If you have an infection, may Allah protect us. Automatically, your body attacks it. If you, COVID and Corona, if it didn't teach us anything, it should teach us the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This virus enters your body, your body learns how to fight it. It figures it out without you doing anything. If a virus enters my phone, it doesn't fight it by itself. If I drop this phone and it cracks, it doesn't heal itself. If I don't charge my phone at night, it doesn't charge itself. So if this cannot come by itself, how can an atheist say that this body, that this universe, that this planet, that this balance, that this perfectly designed human being and animals in a perfect balance. Look, how do we breathe in oxygen and put out carbon dioxide? And how animals, they breathe in oxygen and put out carbon dioxide. But plants, they take in carbon dioxide and put out oxygen. If either balance is gone, we couldn't survive. When you plant a tree, it lets out perfect amounts of carbon dioxide to meet with the soil that lets out the same for it to grow. How can we imagine that this came from nothing? It's illogical. It doesn't make sense. When we look at the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our hearts, they pump blood in the exact equal amount necessary for energy that is exerted. All of us sitting here right now, our hearts are pumping blood. Who is even thinking about that? Which one of you has programmed your heart? Which company, which software developer, which hardware developer sat and made your heart to have that program to pump? Imagine even if you had to physically remember. If all you had to do was remember, we would all be dead. The first time you go to sleep, khalas. <laughs> but who made that system that the heart pumps even when you're asleep, even when you don't think about it? Who makes it that kidneys and livers all function in a perfect manner for you to function. How can you say that this came from nothing? How can an intelligent human being ever imagine that? If we look at the one-way valve of our stomach, it prevents influx of digested food. Otherwise, you would, that food you eat would be coming back up. Those acids that you are, that you are dissolving food would throw up. We have the same on the other side towards your, yani, the canal to take food out. Imagine if that muscle wasn't made to control, you would be walking and uh, waste would be, would be trailing behind you. So who made this system? Imperfection, things that we never think about. Challenge, write this down. Next time you have an atheist come up to you at a da'wah stall or in school or a professor who thinks he knows, the skull bone, you see the skull bone? Of children, before they go through the birth canal, it's unfused. It's put where it's softer and, and put together. Otherwise, as doctors and scientists tell us, the child would not be able to come out from the canal. <coughs> Tayyib, who programmed that? How can evolution explain that? 
evolutionists tell us that the body evolved to necessity. So there was a time when you didn't have these functions and then it evolved to necessity to adapt to its environment. Okay. If the first children didn't have this function of the fused, unfused skull, they couldn't have been born. And if they were born without this function, then that would have never evolved. Either way, evolutions are proven wrong. If they were to say, and I'm going to repeat myself, not because I forgot, but it's from the sunnah. So repeat yourself. If they were to say that before this function of an unfused skull, children could be born with a fully fused skull, then they could not explain why this, evolve, this evolved in this way. Because there would be no necessity. And if it was a necessity, then children before that could not have survived. So either which way it shows the theory of evolution to be false. In their own words, when they tell us about the fact that everything evolved from not being there, meaning random selection and random uh, mutations, then if we look at the nerve endings that we have, that send a signal that is covered at like you see the wires that we cover. So the electric signal is not lost. Before that step in evolution, we could not have sent that signal to muscles. You couldn't have operated. And if it operated before, then it would not have evolved. Either which way, they cannot answer these questions. If we look at the electron that revolves around the nucleus, Scientists tell us today, across the board, that they are at a speed of about a thousand kilometers per second. And if it was less than it, then due to the inside of the nucleus and the, and the uh, force of attraction, it would fall. And no cell could function. So we say, who put that perfect speed in, in place? And if it was not necessary, then how did it evolve? And if it's necessary, then what was before it? All of these show that no doubt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our creator. The perfection of the human body, the perfection of the environment that we live in is a dalil, it's an evidence that there is a khaliq. Now the question will come to be that if we say there is a khaliq, there is a creator, if they admit that, then they go to the level of being agnostics. They said, okay, there is a creator. But we don't know who he is. We don't know what he is. We don't know what that means. We tell them, okay. At least we have got them to a level where they realize that there is a creator. But past that, then we challenge them. We tell them, we will show you the miracles of the Quran. We will show you the miracles of the Nabi alayhi salatu salam. We will show you evidences that they will not be able to challenge with a fair mind. If somebody doesn't have a fair mind, that's up to them. Right? If they have this belief that no doubt, as a phone cannot evolve by itself, as this building cannot evolve by itself, as this air condition, these fans cannot evolve by themselves, then the human body and the atmosphere we live in is more complex and is a greater sign that there is a designer and could not evolve by itself. There had to be a designer. Then who is that designer? We challenge them with this. If we believe there is a creator, which they would come to an agreement there, then no doubt the creator would be more intelligent than us, would have greater intelligence than us, because they created us. And if we create something, we always make sure people understand how to use it. Right? Meaning if you come up with a new technology, then no doubt you would put together a user manual how to use it. If you came up with a brand new technology nobody's ever seen, and you just put it out there for anybody to use any way they want, then they would misuse it and it would be a danger for them. So any new technology that is released, whether it's a new type of laptop, whether it's a new type of car, whether it's a Tesla and electric vehicles or something like this, there are do's and don'ts. And the manufacturer will put with it a user manual. And if it's a complex technology, they will send with it trainers. I work in the medical device industry. So when we develop a new technology, then we have to have what's called the IFU, the instructions for use. How will you use it correctly? What are dangers to it? 
What is the way to, to use it where it will be beneficial and not harmful? And if we don't do that from a safety perspective, we cannot sell that product. And then when we sell it to a hospital, we will send trainers from the manufacturer to show them practically how to use it. Now, how can we say that a creator more intelligent than us, greater than us, made such a beautiful, perfect creation and left it without guidance? La. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our khaliq, he created us and then he sent with us guidance. From the first man, Adam alayhi salatu salam, wahi, revelation showed him and his generations how to live. And when those people would go away from it, and this is something that anybody who works in the scientific fields, in the medical industry or the pharmaceutical industry or any kind of technological industry will understand. If you have a user manual and it becomes outdated, what do you do? You rev it. You send the latest rev and you make sure that if they have a prior rev, like rev A or B or C, that the latest and greatest rev is that which is being used. So when people went away from that guidance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Nuh alayhi salam. With the revolution, the first Rasul, that brought a message to bring them back to Tawheed from the misguidance of shirk. And every Nabi that came and every Rasul that came was like that trainer to show people how to live. And every Risala, every uh, divine book that was sent was like that user manual how to live, how not to steal, how not to kill, how not to deal with the ravers in a wrong way and what to do correctly. How to give zakat, how to make salah, how to fast. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent that guidance. And the last of that we will claim and we will prove is the Quran. And the last of those anbiya we believe and we will prove is Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Tayyib, what is our evidence? Anybody who's fair, anybody with an open mind, who's willing to have that discussion, we challenge them with this. The Quran gives us prophecies about the results of battles, for example, between the Persians and the Romans, which could not have been known prior to the time. How could a man named Muhammad in a desert know what would happen? Tayyip, they might say he guessed. He guessed at it and got it right. Okay, no problem. When you are having, I'm not going to say debate, a discussion, when you're giving da'wah, follow the way of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Don't go into tangents. Tell him, okay, no problem. Did he guess? Okay. When the Quran tells us that all of the heavenly bodies are in an orbit, how would a man in a desert, alayhi salatu salam, without technology, without that development, know this, that till recently scientists were still arguing and debating over. Okay, maybe he guessed twice. Mashallah, you guys have a lot of police here. <laughs> somebody stabbed their toe or something? Anyway, so somebody guessed twice and got it right. Okay, no problem. The Quran describes the development of the fetus. Bones and flesh. How did he get that? No ultrasound, no, no scans, no MRIs, no CTI. How did he get that right? He guessed again and got it right. Subhanallah. The Quran tells us a miracle nobody thinks about. About Abu Lahab and how he will be in the Nar. Think about this. It's not even science, but think about this. When was Surah Lahab revealed? It's Makki or Madni? Ya Ahlul Ilm, Tullab Ilm, where you at, right? It's Makki. Abu Lahab doesn't die till Badr. So in Makkah, these ayat are revealed. At that time, as the ulema of Sirah and Tafsir tell us, this was early in the da'wah. Umar ibn Khattab who was not Muslim at the time. Abu Sufyan was not Muslim at this time. Right? Many of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu were not Muslim at this time. And many of them, including Abu Sufyan radiallahu anhu, was an enemy of Islam at that time. Huh? Umar radiallahu anhu. Right? Other Sahaba, they were at that time mushrikeen. Qabl al-Islam yani before their Islam. At that time, if an ayah was revealed that, for example, Umar radiallahu anhu or يعني, Abu Sufyan yarhamakullah, are going to be in the nar and then they became Muslim, the Quran would have been proven wrong. And when the ayat about Abu Lahab were revealed, 
Abu Lahab could have even for sure accepted Islam and then we would have been like, how can he be in the Nar when he became a Muslim? But this is the miracle of the Quran. When Allah wrote that for Abu Lahab, when this is something that was written, he did not accept Islam, not even for sure. Which shows the truthfulness of the Quran. The Quran puts out a challenge to bring something like it. Now imagine at that time, the shu'ara, the poets of the Arab, yani the, the excellent linguists, balig, fasih, who would write, if you study the, the Asr al-Jahali at the time of ignorance, and their ash'ar, their poems, you will find some of them so eloquent, thousands of lines that they would memorize. And the Quran challenged them to bring like it a book and all of the poets of the Arab couldn't do it. How? How does a man who has never written a poem, the Prophet Muhammad he was not a shair, he was not a poet. How does a man who couldn't read or write, who couldn't have even read somebody else's work and put it forward, how could he bring forth a book that till today when we study Nahu, when we study Sarf, when we study Balagha, when we study the Arabic language and its, and its beauty and its eloquence, we go back to that book. Non-Muslim Arabic professors teaching Arabic go back to the Quran when they talk about Ahkam in Nahu, the rulings in Nahu, about Arab and things. How could they do that? How could all of those Arabs not come together and come with a chapter like it or 10 ayat like it or a verse like it? How could these challenges be put forward that never met? Tell you. You want to keep going? We'll keep going. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave miracles after miracles. One of the miracles that many of our brothers, due to the lack of their knowledge or the weakness of their iman, they shy away from. And this is the miracle of the splitting of the moon. Sometimes we mention this in da'wah, and people, due to the weakness of iman, they say, no, 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 don't mention this. Why? This was only for that time. La. The Nabu of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi is still the day of judgment. And those miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him with the Quran and other than that are till the day of judgment. We put this challenge forward to atheists and Christians and anybody else, modernists and whatever. Tell us an incident in history from that time prior to it or around it. For example, how many of you heard of a man named Alexander? They call him the Great. Raise your hands. You thought you were going to go to sleep here? It's not time to sleep. You waited all this time to sleep? Nah. You never heard of Alexander? Well, raise your hand. <laughs> You're special or something? <laughs> Alexander. What, who was Alexander? Hmm? Conqueror. What did he conquer? Come on, you guys, your history classes can't be that bad, man. <laughs> I don't know about the education in the UK. Nobody's answering. What did he conquer? You learned about him. Don't act like you didn't. Huh? Egypt. Egypt, okay. Central Asia, parts of Europe, parts of India, Persia. Tayyib. What's your name, Akhi? Yeah. Muhammad, Habibi. You don't mind if I pick on you, right? Huh? Khalas. Who saw that? Who saw him conquer Persia? Who's the Rawi? I want their name. What happened? Who was the eyewitness? You all of you with surety have been taught this, right? In your universities, in, you call them uni, right? In your unis. Sounds a little weird for us when you talk about unis, but... Huh? You were taught this or no? All those atheist professors, they teach this or no? Yes or no? Yes. Khalas, people will you sleep? Yes or no? Yes. Answer me. Even a khatib asks you a question in khutbah, you can respond. I'm not even a khatib. Yeah. Yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay. And they believe this. Yes or no? Yes. And it's an extraordinary event for a man from Macedonia to conquer that large parts of the world in that short period of time is amazing. They tell us that. That's why they call him the great. Okay. Who's the eyewitness? How is that eyewitness's memory? How is that eyewitness's moral character? How many eyewitnesses do we have? Do we have enemies and friends? Can we verify that? And who did that eyewitness tell that information to until your history books wrote it down?
Where is the sanad? <coughs> Bring it. Huh? Why the double standard? No, if you're going to accept that, Wallahi, we will bring more evidence about the splitting of the moon than that. Who was an eyewitness? Anas ibn Malik. I can tell you his mother's name. I can tell you his father's name. I can tell you his wife, his children, when he was born, where he lived. And the fact that he was from the people of Medina. He was not in Mecca at the time. So it shows in different, different geographical locations. Who saw it? Abdullah ibn Abbas. I can tell you his father's name. I think you can figure it out also. Huh? We can tell you his mother's name. We can tell you who he was married to. We can tell you his children, where he was born, when he made hijra, when he became Muslim. We can tell you all of that. We can tell you about their memory. We can tell you about their moral character. We can tell you where they died and when they died. Who else saw it? Huh? Abu Sufyan, who was at that time a mushrik. al mughira who died a mushrik, who witnessed this. Go get Al-Bidayah wa Nihayah. Go get the Kutub of Tarikh. Go get the books of Hadith. We have a video on this where I scan all the books and show it if you want to get more evidences. So when you have people in Mecca, in Medina, we have Bedouins that were traveling outside of Mecca that the Quraysh, they asked them and they bore witness that they saw it. Mushrikeen, polytheists, enemies of the Prophet ﷺ that admitted to seeing this, then how is that not extraordinary evidence? How can you deny that? First person account. Not just that, I can tell you who they gave this news to. Who was the tabi'i who heard this khabar from the sahabi? And who did they give this news to? And until it was written down in the books of hadith, I can give you the full chain. And I can show you how many chains. And every single narrator in that chain, I can give you their biography. And I can give you their reliability. And I can give you about their adal, their moral character, and their dabt, and their precision in reporting, and their memory. Tayyip. Now they will say, okay, we want different geographical locations. Okay, relax, we got you. First thing, first challenge. Anybody know Surah Qamar? Huh? What's the first ayah of Surah Qamar? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the, the, the splitting of the moon in the Quran and this ayah was read in front of the mushrikeen repeatedly and not a single one of them denied this. Yani the enemies of the Prophet ﷺ, imagine if I told you guys today that when I was on, the reason I was late is I was, I was on my way and I looked up and I split Big Ben. Forget the moon. <laughs> Your beloved Big Ben was in two pieces. Mm -hmm. And then I snapped my fingers and it came back together. You are my friends. You are my brothers. You are my brothers in Iman. You would be like, I think he didn't get enough sleep. <laughs> that jet lag got to him. <laughs> right? well, you wouldn't believe me. Right? You would challenge that, right? You would say, uh, brothers that were in the same car as me, right, will tell me, Akhi, we were with you, we didn't see that, right? Now imagine my enemies, mushrikeen, kuffar, they, if they were there, and I said I split bed, Big Ben, and they were there, they would jump on it, videos would be going viral. Uthman lost his mind, he said he split Big Ben, and we were there, and he didn't. Tayyip, but think about that. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sahaba, they said it. All of the mushrikeen of Mecca, none of them challenges. Find me one historic report, one hadith, one kitab of tarikh, where a mushrik from Mecca said that the moon did not split. The enemies of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam admitted to it. Tayyib, you want more evidence? We got you. No problem. Tayyib. One of the evidences that many brothers shy away from, but we will give evidence is the reports that came out of Hind, out of India. Now, before I mention them, I want to be explicitly clear. When we mention hadith, we have a standard that we judge by that cannot be matched by anybody in tarikh. No book of history is checked like the kutub of, of hadith. No western book of history is checked 
like the books of tarikh with ilm al-rijal and jarh and ta'deel of rawat and adal and that that's a standard they cannot meet so we cannot expect non-muslim hindu historians to meet that standard they didn't have that standard right so when we talk about splitting of the moon atheists when they want reports it could not have been seen in america or in europe why because this is the early part of the night in arabia it's not deep night it's the early part of the night moon is visible but people are awake and at that time the people in the desert would go to bed on time it wasn't like us up all night so this is early part of the night so what would be the time in europe it would be daytime in the u.s it would be early daytime so you're not going to see the moon and in places like japan it would be deep night later part of the night but in India, it would be a little bit later, but still where people could see. And we have reports out of India that have been documented by multiple sources. Those sources do not hold up to our checking. That is true, because our checking is that stringent. But there are multiple reports, oral and written, in later dates, about kings in India that saw the splitting of the moon. And those that became Muslim from seeing this and masajid that were built that are still standing. Now, even if they don't meet our standard by Indian historians, this is acceptable history. In fact, today you can go there and you can see the masjid and you can see the reports and you can talk to the people there that talk about the kings of India that saw this splitting. Now, difference in reports and names and things are there because that's how that history is written. They had titles and names and so on. But... It is such a well-known fact in Indian history that the anti-Islam, the, the, the Islamophobic Prime Minister of India, Modi, he made a small replica of that masjid, made out of gold, and gave it as a gift to the uh, king of Saudi Arabia in trying to build trade relations. Imagine... And he tweeted about it, and I've scanned those tweets and I put them in the video. That even an Islamophobe, somebody who hates Muslims, that has put laws against Islam, that has made many hardships on our Muslim brothers and sisters, may Allah make their affairs easy for them. Right? Even he has to admit that in Indian history, they have an evidence, an acceptable historic fact for them according to their standards that people in India saw the splitting of the moon and the king accepted Islam when he met the Muslims later on and he told them what he saw and they explained it to him and he built that masjid until today they are using that as a historic evidence. So now we challenge atheists bring us that type of evidence for Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar or the Roman early kings and things bring us those eyewitnesses those things that they tell us in history and they expect us to believe blindly we give them more evidence than that so when we have these challenges put forward in the Quran in Sahih Ahadith when we see these clear evidences atheists have no response for this this is why they are upon doubt and we are upon surety well, Alhamdulillah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us to come and sit and discuss and I want to open up for question and answer later but alhamdulillah there is a brother that wants to take the uh, shahada yeah. so we will do that first because our da'wah in the end this is the most important thing more than views more than subscribers more than who likes you and who doesn't like you more than who wants to give you sincere and unsincere advice and all of these kinds of things the most important thing is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us the means of hidayah for people because if we understood the seriousness of a nar of jahannam of a fire that will be for the kuffar forever then we wouldn't want that even for our worst enemies and that's why the prophet alayhi salam he would go repeatedly to the quraysh who were harming him and he would be giving them da'wah towards islam that's why when the people of taif they, they harmed the Prophet ﷺ, but he still made dua for their guidance. Because he ﷺ understood the importance of hidayah, of guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the severity of Jahannam, and the, and the, the greatness of the bounty of Al-Jannah. 
So your da'wah should never be focused towards views or subscribers or, or winning debates or this. It should always be focused towards becoming a means of people being saved from the hellfire.